And I guess maybe just to bring this back to Nietzsche, the thing that I find so beautiful about him is that he's he really is a kind of maybe the the most profound observer of human activity that's ever lived. Hmm. He really is someone who just watched very, very closely. And I think outside of the the blow to my ego uh, when I read something from him and think, you know, there are two things I often think. One is, mm-hmm. shit, he said that about 30 times better than I would have ever said it, <laughs> you know, and I hate, him, I hate him for that. <laughs> and the second is I could never in a thousand years have thought what he thought, and yet he's right. What he yeah. says is true. Wow. So there's, that's, it's incredible to see things that I'm sure that he saw in, in similar ways, or there are similar fundamentals, right? Even though we live in a, in a somewhat different world. Mm. And yet he's, he's so uh, real. He's so grounded. Uh, he takes the tradition of the French moralists, right? Montaigne, La Rochefoucauld, and uh, Pascal. And he just takes them to another, another level. He does mm. this kind of very profound, meaningful observation that, that ended up changing the whole world, right? I mean, Nietzsche is the the guy to go to. It's Plato and Nietzsche, more or less. It's everybody's a footnote to Plato, and then everybody will soon be a footnote to Nietzsche. Wow. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the world's first startup accelerator program focused exclusively on the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what is possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to Wolf nyc.com today to apply for the program or learn more again that is wolf nyc.com robert malka welcome to the what is money show it's cool to finally be on <laughs> it's great to have you here uh it's been a long time coming we have known each other since 2018 we met at summit los angeles that's right and we were doing a, a kind of a strange program which you just reminded me was called Human Connection. That's right. Um, do you want to tell that story? Yeah. It's, so Summit's a really bougie event Yeah. where everything is carbon zero and everybody's just celebrating <laughs> the fandom. Uh, kind of ashamed I went, but yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, there was this activity called Human Connection. It was midday. And this uh, woman basically got us into groups of three. And the exercise was one of us sat in the middle and two of you spoken to the ear of that person Mm -hmm. one of the ears of that person so one on your left one on your right and they were just supposed to say whatever spontaneously came to them and uh robert your what you said to me was extremely memorable to me Hmm. basically went into my ear and you were like listen motherfucker you are a fucking badass you're gonna crush (laughs) it you're gonna slay i have no doubts about it It it's like i don't even know who this guy is you know (laughs) i don't remember what i said 
but it was basically a full minute of that, just hearing Robert Breedlove fucking <laughs> amp you up. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I got to chat with this guy. So uh-huh. we started chatting, and that was when you had. Uh, I think you had you had really fallen into the rabbit hole for sure by then. Um, I don't know. I had just got the Bitcoin tattoo, so it was a, nice. I was officially all skin in the game, all in. That's it. Yeah. And uh, I had known about Bitcoin, and I was. Uh, you know, wrecked in 2017 and I was skeptical and you basically orange pulled me, you laid out the arguments and um, started to really look at Bitcoin seriously after that. So that's, that's the story. We kept in touch and then um, bull run 2021, we mm-hmm. did off. Uh, we started to see each other at Bitcoin events. At some point I was like, I have to get involved in this space. So I think that's sort of what's happened. Uh, that's great. I love, I love to hear new people coming into Bitcoin. Yeah. It's such a cool journey. Uh, I should quickly introduce you you are on the board now of bitcoin today coalition Uh and the author of the textbook introduction to the ethics of sign language interpreting in the middle east um and in between that little story that you told there was one point where you sent me a draft of the other book the memoirs that are unpublished that's right it's it'll be out soon um but very unique very unique challenging upbringing you had. I don't know to what extent you want to talk about that and how maybe it relates to what we're going into later today, which is Nietzschean philosophy. Right. So, um, like it's just back to basics. Uh, I was, I'm a child of deaf adults. We're called CODAs. Um, so I have deaf parents, both parents. And, uh, um, I guess I, you know, I don't know, I never really know where to start Mm. and where to dive in with that experience, but I guess I'll open up by saying that it was challenging. Mm-hmm. It's it's very challenging to, um, it's not just a question of being available to your parents, right? It's also a question of being in situations you might not have expected. So having to pay bills as a 10-year-old or um, having to interpret for my mom's lawyer during a very ugly divorce. So mm-hmm. those are the kinds of things that uh, I had to do um, was a, in a, even though you're not interpreting 24 seven as a kid, when you're turned on like that, when you're switched on in that way, you never really turn back off. So it's a 24 seven kind of job mm. day in, day out, thinking about whether your mom needs you or whether you can be there. And, um, and you end up, I mean, the cliche way to say it is you grow up very quickly, but yeah. maybe the, the more difficult way to say it is you can't help being a parent to your parents. And then as you get older, your view of the situation escalates. It complicates it. That is to say, you start to understand that there's a world out there where everybody is normal. I say this and and not necessarily in air quotes in a way, right? Because the hearing world is, a, is the natural dominant world. Mm. We have our ears for a reason. And if you, if you don't have use of them, and you only have the use of your eyes, uh, you're, you're necessarily going to behave differently, see things differently. And there's also the inevitable question of when somebody hears you, if you choose to use your voice as a deaf person. So as a hearing kid, you start to see the tension between this world that you grew up in home Mm -hmm. and this world that's out there, the world, and you're expected to be in both. And home eventually becomes this place where you're never fully comfortable, not because your parents make you uncomfortable per se, but because there's a there's a natural sort of dynamic difference between whatever the world thinks of deafness or perce- how they perceive deafness or how mm-hmm. they hear deafness. And you you internalize that inevitably. I mean you want you want your parents to be welcomed into the world as you are mm-hmm. always. So um, that becomes very hard and what you bring back home and how that gets taken out at home and uh, on top of the responsibilities you're already having that you may or may not resent, that stuff kind of becomes, it piles on, it gets more difficult. Wow, yeah, amazing. So, I mean, tension between two worlds, right? It's two different worlds you're living in, in a way, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and then sort of a, the, there's another element to this which, which I think is is exciting in a philosophical sense and difficult in an in an earthy sense in a concrete sense, um, so that you have to act. Practically speaking, as mm-hmm. an interpreter, you're really an actor for all intents and purposes. You are behaving as someone else 
when they are saying what they want to say to your mom. And then you are your mom when you're saying what she wants to say to them. Oh, uh, I see. You're like a conduit for the person doing the speaking. That's it. Yeah. So if you are interpreting for a guy who is flirting with your mom, huh. that is a whole other layer of fucked up and strange. I mean, I just really don't know how else to put it. Yeah. And how you choose to deal with that information. I mean, if you're interpreting for your mom, you're not a professional interpreter, so you can manipulate the information a little bit or you can right. make it go down easier as it were. But that kind of stuff is is not necessarily easy. And of course, some people will just say, I'm not interpreting that. Like, what's wrong with you? I'm not going to yeah. go through that. But sometimes, uh, let's suppose that you're in a situation where that person has something your mom needs or wants, right? right? Another There's layer. A, a grounded situation. Like, I don't know, you're buying an RV. That's a true story. Or, um, I don't know, it, you know, there are all kinds of, there are endless situations where where some somebody could hold some position of authority and usually it would just be a dynamic between uh, the two people and it would just be what it is and that's fine. But then you insert the kid into it and then it becomes, you know, maybe maybe obnoxious, maybe difficult, maybe you wish you weren't uh, present for it. Right, right, right. And so the the acting then, this is the, the wearing of the mask. And does it, did that predispose you to Nietzschean philosophy or is, is there a connection there? I wonder about predisposition. Um, I think I think what I love most about Nietzsche is his 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 eros for life. Right? He he really is a lover of life. That's mm. that's his premise. He has no interest in other worlds or other lives. Or um, he he wants to be in this world as fragile and difficult and frustrating as it is. He wants to be at home in this one. And many of us do not want to be at home in this one or don't mm. feel at home in this one. Uh, that includes me. I mean, I think uh, the question of who am I was always a difficult question, especially if you've been 10 different people in a day. Mm. But even more so because I think Nietzsche never tries to be devastatingly optimistic or obnoxiously despairing. Mm -hmm. That's not his interest. He wants to be, he wants to give a grounded view for why life is worth living. And in the end, that's not quite something with reasons behind it, right? You can't you can't right. give any first principles or logic as to why life is worth living. It either is or it isn't. Mm -hmm. You can either be persuaded by virtue of some beautiful speech or some beautiful experience to say life is worth living mm -hmm. or not. So that's really what it is. And and I suppose what 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 made me feel deeply connected to Nietzsche outside of that was as you're suggesting this this masking means that I had the opportunity to see things in a hundred different ways. So you can develop sympathies for a, for an individual, of course, but um, you're also able to maybe extract a single good thing out of someone who seems to be all bad or all hmm. worthless. And then suddenly hmm. they're human. They're human again. They say something as a throwaway and it's not just... Uh, it's It's not just the Alice Miller style psychology of going back to their childhood and seeing how they were mistreated or brutalized or the kind of resentment they hold. And this is how they turned out. And it's not just a question of looking at this person's character and saying that maybe they were naturally born ill, as it were, naturally born bad. But you you may actually get to see that there's some element of beauty in them. Mm. And that helps you slowly shed the disgust that you might have for anything that's going on in the world. And uh, I say I say myself that I, you know, I certainly am prone to feelings of, of, you know, such feelings from time to time. So trying to get rid of that and, and extract the richness from life, that's, e that, you know, I like the challenge of, of mask wearing as it were, even though I don't, I don't really interpret much anymore. Um, I like, I like it even in the abstract, I kind of pretend to be somebody else in my own mind. I run a simulation as it were. Oh, and I walk out the other side and I say, okay, so this person seems to be this way. Yeah. Something interesting about yeah. that, right? And by the way, I mean, that even goes so far as trying to follow the way a person walks, you know, mm. match their walk. What is that like? Well, that's very strange. And their gait is different. And you might see life differently just because of your the length of your gait. I don't know. Mm. I mean, I, I, why not? It just seems like it's worth experimenting, mm. right? Just going all the way back to basics and saying, what observations are worth making and what, where do they take you? Right. Yeah. Wow. 
Yes, yeah, because people wear masks in the world. Like, not it sounds like it has a negative connotation, but I think people do it all the time, right? People in their professional roles versus their family roles versus their friend. Like, we, what is you know the Shakespeare quote? The whole world is uh, a stage, and all the men merely players. Thank you. Um, there's definitely this performative element to human existence, right? That we're filling roles, um, and I wonder if you having to wrestle with those different layers right as you said and the guy that's floating with your mom like how do you translate that does that predispose you to deeper thinking about human nature to some extent and i don't know what the the nietzsche general project was but i'm curious if there were any links you know from your life experience into uh i guess resonating with what that i guess i'd ask you to tell us what that is <laughs> um but I, th there's usually a connection, right, between your life experience and what you are interested in or what you gravitate towards. So I'm just trying to tease that out. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I wonder about this a lot. I, I, I almost wonder if what you just asked me was something like, how, do you, how did you love what you love? And, mm. and then I go, well, I, I wonder what love is to that extent. And that is to say, um, love is this incredibly potent force that's not... It's, uh, for the record, it's Robert Pippin who says this, another Robert. Mm. Uh, he wrote a book called Nietzsche's Psychology and First Philosophy, and I'll probably be borrowing a lot from it, so you should check it out if you'd like. Mm. Um, but he says something like, love is, love is strange, right? Because it's not, it's not grounded in reason, right? It, it's not a checklist. Mm -hmm. Somebody goes, you're like, do you love the job? They go, yeah, I love it. I get 250K a year. You're like, well, I don't hear anything about love for the job or right? mm -hmm. something about love for a perk or you like a perk about mm -hmm. it. So it's not that, but it's also, um, it's not totally instinct, right? There's something evaluative in love. Mm -hmm. That is to say, when I choose to love somebody, is it a choice? When I love somebody, they, that says something about me mm -hmm. inevitably. And same thing for career, right? When I love something that I do, it also says something about me, but I didn't walk in with a checklist and somehow the world gave me permission to find this thing where somehow I found it in the world, the world showed it to me. And because of a particular inclination that I had or a certain intention that I had, I found it mm. and I was glued to it. And uh, so I guess I, I don't, I, I wonder, I, I don't know. I, I never, you know, I never liked interpreting, never enjoyed it. It's never been fun for me. I've always wanted to be the one to say things, but I've been made not to say things, <laughs> been made to say other people's shit, often <laughs> shit I disagree with, you know? <laughs> and am I ever gonna love that? No, I think if you put me through that another 30 years, I'd probably be hunchbacked. Right. <laughs> so, and yet, and yet, yes, there, there is something I, I don't, I don't know if I wanna say it this way, maybe I should, I made it intellectually stimulating or I found what, what, what was exhilarating about human connection, as it were, mm. between people in that moment. There's something incredible about interpreting, which is to say that you get to be the honest one in the room. That is to say, you're truly just facilitating what's being said. Mm. And they may be wearing masks, but you, here's the irony or the paradox, you as the mask wearer are honest, right? facilitating honestly, though you're not yourself but you also are, right? In the same way that a shirt both disguises and reveals yes. your physique. This is the nature of a symbol, actually. Yeah, right. It, it reveals as much as it conceals, but different aspects of things. Right, Yeah. right. And so there was this kind of exhilarating moment every so often. You don't really get it much, but you are a fly on the wall. You're a nobody, you're a nothing, right? You can be recognized, you know, they'll let you get coffee or food or whatever it might mm -hmm. be, whatever the event is. I've done, you know, Juvenile Hall and I've done Bill Clinton and I've right. done Elon Musk and so on. Uh, so you can you can do those things. Um, but there, every so often there's a, there's a moment where you realize an authentic second and you, you get to be the one to take that moment and, and hold it. You get to do something with it. Or you even just get to watch it because they don't really see you there. So there's a meeting of 12 people or one person and it's a cancer diagnosis or I mean, who knows what. And you 
you uh, you get to to be there as a kind of anthropologist. And I guess maybe just to bring this back to Nietzsche, the thing that I find so beautiful about him is that he's he really is a kind of maybe the the most profound observer of human activity that's ever lived. Hmm. He really is someone who just watched very very closely. And I think outside of the the blow to my ego uh, when I read something from him and think, you know, there are two things I often think. One is, mm-hmm. shit, he said that about 30 times better than I would have ever said it, <laughs> you know, and I hate, him, I hate him for that. <laughs> and the second is I could never in a thousand years have thought what he thought. And yet he's right. What he yeah. says is true. Wow. So there's, that's, it's incredible to see things that I'm sure that he saw in, in similar ways or there are similar fundamentals, right? Even though we live in a, in a somewhat different world. And yet he's he's so uh, real. He's so grounded. Uh, he takes the tradition of the French moralists, right? Montaigne, La Rochefoucauld, and uh, Pascal, and he just takes them to another another level. He does mm. this kind of very profound, meaningful observation that that ended up changing the whole world, right? I mean, Nietzsche is the the guy to go to. It's Plato and Nietzsche, more or less. It's everybody's a footnote to Plato, and then everybody will soon be a footnote to Nietzsche. Wow. Yeah. What, what it, how does he look at philosophy? Which may be another way of asking the question about the general project, but what is it that's different about him? And I, also, I think he's considered like the father of postmodernism, something like that. But I think, I don't know that he would like that. Yeah, I don't know. That so maybe, you like could, that maybe you could just speak to how he looks at philosophy. And then if there's a relationship to postmodernism, you yeah. can tie that in. So, where do we start with Nietzsche? So his his project is this. He sees a problem, and it's a very serious problem in the modern world, and he saw it back in the 1870s. And that question is, what is the value of valuing? What does it mean to make a commitment to something? And what does it mean to believe in something? Uh, that's that's this is that's an element of his question. And what he started to realize was that as he looked around, Christians didn't really believe in Christianity very much anymore. They were already starting to distance themselves from the idea of God. This is his famous God is dead line, right? And he wanted to, he started to worry basically. So, so if somebody if somebody believes in Christianity, if somebody is a Christian the way the early Christians were, that is to say, ferociously, people who would go into, you know, be dragged into gladiator stadiums, the martyrs, they get right. And, and they were told, listen, just say that, you know, our Roman, you know, the Roman gods are, are you know, God, gods that you believe in, or, you know, say that the emperor is your emperor. Mm-hmm. You just have to say that, and then we're not going to sick the lions on you. And they said, no, my path to the kingdom of heaven, right? And by the way, fundamentally, it was not a love of one's neighbor that got them killed. It was a purely egotistical, and I don't say that with any malice. I don't say that in a bad way. It's ego is, I think, very important and uh, worth discussing. But they say something like, no, my path to the kingdom of heaven is to understand my God is the true God. The emperor can't be in the way of that. You're, you can go ahead and kill me. I know about my afterlife. I know about the next mm. life, right? That depth of commitment is incredible to us today. And there were lots of people who were non-Christian, who believed in their own, who had their own religious beliefs, right? And they were equally as profound, people who would go and die on the battlefield a certain way and, and so on. So what he started to see was that Christianity had, had more or less taken over the whole world. And Islam is, I think, a reflection of that, a similar thing, right? Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all, they more or less fundamentally share similar principles. That is to say, and we can go into this, Robert, if you want, but mm. it seems to me that they all share things like the afterlife is more beautiful than the present life mm. and, and so on. They, they basically try it. The religions that more or less minimize the power of this life in relation to the infinite, mm-hmm. in relation to God. So this religion had taken over, right? Judaism, Christianity, I don't like to say Judeo-Christianity, had taken over the more or less the whole world. And then... Its effect was starting to wane, and the problem was that the religions that Christianity had replaced were no longer there. And so, sort of like um, a, a bunch of type 
you know, types of trees all becoming one tree. There were once, you know, pines and oaks mm. and, and so on. They all just become pine. And then a single illness starts to infect the pine. Oh, it's a monoculture. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so Christianity sort of became the monoculture of the world. Mm. And that's a huge threat if you no longer are capable of believing in God. What's left? Nothing. Nihilism. Mm. Zero-ness. Nothingness. So Nietzsche says we really should sound the alarm. And of course, how he sounds the alarm is a very interesting question in itself. But he says, we now have a new problem. And the problem is, what do you do when God as an idea no longer really has hold over people? Mm -hmm. How do you get people to believe in something for a long time? So we had this incredible, Christianity created this incredible tension, this immense tension that had never existed before. And that tension was that we are nothing in the face of the infinite. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you compare? I mean, anything that you do wrong, any sin that you make threatens your entrance into the kingdom of heaven at best. And at worst, it damns you to an eternal hell, right? Mm -hmm. Eternal suffering. The pressure of that over 2000 years did a few things. Number one, according to Nietzsche, number one, it had people who were very healthy and strong by nature, would never have despised or believed in sin, right? Would never have despised anything about themselves, which ultimately that's what sin is, right? It says, these are these things, these characters or qualities in you that are bad and you have to overcome them. You have to mm -hmm. go towards, I'll just use Christian, you know, Christian language, the light. Mm -hmm. So those people ended up feeling guilty, right? They criminalized themselves. They ended up saying hatred, jealousy, pride. These are all bad things. And they ended up developing a kind of inward resentment toward themselves and their inner worlds started to get bigger. So if you are able to navigate the world and you have no guilt, you don't really need to self-reflect. You're operating on instinct. Mm -hmm. It's a natural instinct, right? You mm -hmm. want a fish, you kill a fish. You want a moose, you kill a moose. You want a woman, you have a woman, right? It's sort of this very simple, simpler world in a, in a sense. Um, but Chris Christianity ended up creating this really open inner world. And then uh, God started to disappear and people now don't know what to put in its place. Mm. This great inner world, this great capacity for what I'm going to call psychological warfare, but I don't mean it in the, in the modern sense. I mean, in the sense of uh, using reason as, we as a weapon or being able to use language as some mm. persuasive medium. Uh -huh. So how do you, how do you get people to believe in things without looking at the infinite, you know, without an infinite, when we've been used to that for so long, what about this life is still worthwhile when there's no infinite at all? Hmm. There's something like God represented the pinnacle of people's system of values, their hierarchy of values, something like that. And when you remove, and this is, you could almost say this through an economic sense that human action it's always speculative right you never know what response from the environment your action will produce so everything's sort of premised on this action itself is premised on this faith and we always have to be pointing towards something have to be oriented towards something so it's like is Nietzsche saying that we've removed that general orientation it was like we're all kind of collaborating in this project called Christianity over time and then he's saying basically the idea of God is now dying or dead and I'm reciting this secondhand, but I think it was Peterson said that he basically said that um, the collapse of that primary value uh, necessitated the reintroduction of another value, right? We needed an alternative. You can't just kill God and leave that vacuum there. There has to be something. That's right. And was it Nietzsche's perspective? And this is where Peterson disagrees with Nietzsche, actually, that we needed to objectively determine our values and what values should be at the top of that hierarchy so that we could orient the world. This is, so I don't think Nietzsche says something like that because. And I could be yeah. misquoting. And that's fine. I could be misinterpreting. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Well, I, I also think Nietzsche is often misinterpreted, but yeah. the removal of God is something incredibly profound, right? For several reasons. Number one, God was this way for us to say something like there is an objective view of the world uh -huh. from the view of God in ex eternus, right? From the view of God, there is this objective reality. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna, I'm not a relativist, right? I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not a big Foucault guy or a Derrida guy, mm -hmm. even though I'm 
sure they have interesting things to say, but yeah. um, Nietzsche says that there there is something really profound that happens there, which is when you remove this big umbrella that puts us all together, right. you just have localized, perhaps, I suppose, localized shared perspective, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what's called, what, what I've seen called perspectivism. And so then there's this kind of interesting jockeying for power. Let's, let's get into this a bit. The question is, um, he talks about will to power, right? People often understand Nietzsche as being a kind of brutalist. When we talk about conquering, we talk, we, we think things like, oh, Nietzsche just wanted I don't know, men to go out and take the world again. Right. He's not, that's not really what he's saying. He often talks about things in terms of reinterpretation. What his central project is, his central project is tied to understanding how to win. Uh, I'm not going to say, I mean, I'll say it, whatever. I'll say this in layman's terms, so forgive me, but mm. win the game of reinterpretation. So the question of what is good, what is evil, and what is power are themselves questions. Mm -hmm. It's not clear. It was clear under Christianity, it was clear under God, and it was clear under the Greeks. And the question is, what do we do now? So Nietzsche is very interested in understanding how to exert will over interpretations of the world. Hmm. That's really the issue. It's not just about going in and murdering people you disagree with. And it's really not about that at all. I don't know quite what that solves. So, so then you, you kind of have this other positive. See, I think Nietzsche was actually more decentralized than people think, right? So Christianity is fundamentally a sort of centralized outlook. There's God, God manages everything, everything good and bad that happens to you is the result of God. Hmm. Um, Whereas before there were these kind of, there were these kind of two ways of looking at things, or I think he says two kingdoms in, in his book, Daybreak. There was your plans, right? Your actions. And there was pure chance and chance was relegated to the gods. So he describes it as kind of, we have this little spider web. We work really hard to make it. And then the wind blows it away and that's the gods, right? You can just mourn it all you want, but the gods decided. And so it goes. And then Christianity said, there's actually just one thing and it's, god mm -hmm. so everything will turn out good in the end there's a glorious end always and even the things that you think might be accident were not accidents we're just too small-minded we're too stupid we're not profound enough we're not god right we're nowhere mm -hmm. near his perspective we can't see the whole we can't see his actions his decisions um everything is the way it is because god willed it ultimately and that's you know still that still works in conjunction with personal will and and personal decision making and that's why we have Right, we have a soul and so on. We can decide whether to be in the kingdom of heaven or in, in eternal damnation. And then he says that with the collapse of God, there's actually still perhaps one world, but um, the question of what your will is and what it isn't and the question of how the world works, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a little different now. Mm. So, so that's, that's what Nietzsche is trying to get at this question of how, how do we, how do we understand interpretation? How do we, how do we, how do we do so that? I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's a lot there. I am. Um, yeah. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility and it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self custody. So you need a device like iCoin wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code Bitcoin23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian Chris Rock. This is insurance. You got to have some insurance. 
You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> and I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download this state-of-the-art wallet software. Let's talk about, because you said this offline to me, and I'm curious, maybe this will help throw some light on what we're talking about here. This relationship, you had this fabulous quote about Nietzsche's perspective on the relationship between psychology and the sciences. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it sounded to me almost as if he was saying it's all psychological, right? Well, we're trying, we're, um, trying to impute certain qualities to objective reality, perhaps this is my understanding, but he, his perspective may be instead that it's, we're talking about psychology, even through the sciences. Do you, do you recall the quote that you shared? Yeah. He says in the beginning of beyond good and evil, that psychology is once again, the queen of the sciences and the path to our most fundamental problems. So when he says that, what he's saying is something like, there is no metaphysics. There is only, there is no system. There is no framework by which to really understand this world. And yet you can still make really profound, interesting observations about it. Hmm. Those, pro, those, those observations are going to fundamentally be psychological in nature. And then when you ask, you know, what do you mean by psychology? What, what exactly does that look like? The observation part I'll pick up there because I heard this quote recently, not a Nietzsche quote, that every man's few realize that every individual's observations of the world are at the same time a confession of character. Mm-hmm. I'm paraphrasing here, but I, that's when you, when you mentioned that quote from Nietzsche, it sounded something like that to me. It's like, and Peterson says this all the time, right? There's infinite facts in the world. You have to decide which facts are relevant to you, your course of action. Um, so maybe there's something there. It's, it's, he's, he's putting all of this in a, a psychological grounding rather than a theological grounding, perhaps? For sure. Absolutely. I mean, one thing I actually, I really want to say, and I think I've been meaning to say it, is that he's interested in getting people who would otherwise have erotic inclinations, a love of knowing, right? A love mm-hmm. of pursuing something in itself, which, which of course is going to lend itself to the question of value, right? If you have something in you that represents perhaps a new value for the world, Mm -hmm. new interpretation for the world, he wants to bring that out and encourage you to apply it. Mm. So there, there are endless people in this world who will just speak very practically, right? Have lived under the Prussian school system Mm -hmm. and they have, they feel, they feel a deadening inside Mm -hmm. and they're, they're sort of made to be automatons, but in them is this roiling world of questions mm-hmm. and answers, right? There are a bunch of plants in them that need blossoming. They need to be watered. Right. And he wants to open those people up to the chance to express their erotic love, right? And so, when we say erotic, you mean eros in the classic sense, right? Yes. This is the the consumptive love. Right. As exactly. I understand it. Yeah. Exactly. A love a love that's um right, you say, why do you love this girl? Because I do, right? Mm-hmm. I really love this girl. There's mm-hmm. something there's something about the want to like Having been seduced, right? Love is a question of, I guess, I suppose in some way, right? Having been seduced by something, I now want to participate in the act of courting seduction. Mm. And that's, right, I'm not saying ideological, but I'm saying there is there are ways to live in this world that are going to be very distinct. I'll, I'll just give a grounded example. So he talks, for example, about criminality. He says, what if one day there were a world in which 
criminals, there was no explicit centralized justice system, but anyone who was a criminal decided based on their own law that mm -hmm. they were guilty of something mm -hmm. and they abided by their own punishments. They were judge, jury, executioner, as it were. Hmm. He said, imagine, imagine that world in which someone was actually strong enough to actually, to, to love their crime, to love their error and not to want to confess to it, right? Or, or give in to it or be a scapegoat to what you were in the past, but to say, I want to be no other way. This crime shaped me. This crime is for me. And I am also strong enough for the punishment. And not only that, I'm strong enough to make my own punishment and to punish myself, but without any of the moral acid, right? Without any of this, I'm beating myself over the head. I'm not good enough. I'm a, no, no, no. It's a different kind of perspective on crime and criminality altogether. Hmm. So he thinks how many other worlds could we have whereby this kind of this kind of open experimentation, post-moral experimentation could actually exist. Well, That's exhilarating, right? I mean, there's something so interesting about that. Wouldn't people just refuse that at the outset though, just out of, I'm going all the way down to like just Darwinian impulse for self-preservation that people tend to rationalize what they've done to themselves, right? So I think, I think this comes back to that erotic question. Mm. If you can get people to love something enough, they will do it. Hmm. So the question is, you know, do people who self-rationalize love? Can they? That I mean, and I, I mean, I, that's a really, I mean, I didn't mean to open that can of worms, but there's a, there's a, you know, what, what exactly is the nature of someone who loves? Mm -hmm. I don't. I think there might be a few underlying fundamental things about them. Well, what is the? Yeah, I mean, what action really? Def when I think of love expressed in action, it seems like selfless action, right? You'll you'll do anything for your child, right? You'll take a bullet for your child, as most parents will say. Mm -hmm. um, how else do you exhibit, I guess in the Nietzschean view, when he's saying this, people living out of this uh, erotic impulse, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Like what type of action is that? I wonder, I think he would say something like, selflessness doesn't really exist uh -huh. that actions well i mean i suppose it does exist but all that means in practice are the feelings of pity and compassion and those are basically the equivalent of you kicking your teeth in they basically say something like your project whatever you are can't be because other people's projects matter more other people matter more mm. and I think he's worried that some people who are very sensitive are actually more likely to feel pity, more likely to feel compassion, and more likely to abandon their personal project, mm. whoever they are. And be taken advantage of and do by people with less scruples. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, even, maybe not even less, maybe not even taken advantage of, but just they're told their whole lives that their whole job is to help other people. Yeah. And there might actually be a virtue to selfishness, which is to say, I'm going to work on me yeah. and see where I end up. I'm, I'm a thing. I mean, we'll just see what that is. I, yeah. I don't know what that is. Well, the, I yeah. mean, Ayn Rand has an essay by that very title, right? Sure. The Virtue Virtuous of Selfishness. Right. And so there has to be a balance between the two. I don't disagree with that at all. Mm -hmm. um, even in dealing with your children, right? There's going to be times where the parent probably behaves selfishly. Um, almost certainly, right? We're all egoic. We all have ego. So, and actually, I don't know that term. I was talking to Jeff Booth yesterday and he's like, no, there's a difference between self-preservation and the ego. And I had always just kind of thought that was it. I thought the ego was kind of your Darwinian self-preservation, right? Like the, the bear jumps through the window and your ego is what makes you get up and run. So that might be a muddy term for me, but, um, I almost want to even go farther than that and say, even when a mother takes a bullet for her child, there's still some element of selfishness in that, right? But it's to say- Genetic selfishness. <laughs> maybe, yeah. yeah. Or even more than that, which is to say that this is this is the altar upon which I place my love, mm. right? I celebrate my love by taking that bullet. For mm. there, there's something really important about that because I, I want to be wary of making selfishness just another way to mean bad, which is right. often what we do. True. Or hatred is just another word for meaning bad or jealousy is just another word for meaning bad. Yeah. I, 
like if we just act like an alien, which I think, I believe Nietzsche was, I believe he was. <laughs> and we just say, let's look at all of these feelings outside of morality. Mm -hmm. What is their function? What is their purpose, right? There's actually an economy of emotion that exists. And so if you hate something, there must be some non-sinful reason for having it. Mm -hmm. There must be some compelling outlet for it. It must do something for a healthy individual, mm -hmm. right? Hate can't simply be... It must have utility. Yeah. Simply put. What is the utility of hatred? That's a question I've never pondered. Yeah. Well, I guess it depends on... There might also be kinds of hatred, right? Mm -hmm. There might be um, if I'm a marathon runner and I'm competing with another marathon runner and he beats me by 0.3 seconds, mm. well, I fucking hate him, <laughs> right? But I don't hate him in the sense that I wish he didn't exist. Actually, I desperately need him yeah, because he makes me me. Right. I'm going to beat him by 0.4 seconds. That's just kind of like that dance between good and evil too. That It's like something like evil tests the integrity of the good. So like destroys what doesn't really, what might be, it's not good until it works and can persist over time, right? So there has to be something that tests that it's as if evil were the quality assurance of the good, something like that. When you say evil, do you mean Christian evil? Um, in general, I would say to try and keep it economic, yeah, yeah, yeah. like a violation of person or property. Yeah. Right. That's okay. uh, yeah. anytime you cross that line of consent. And I haven't heard a good argument about this. I don't think there's any justification for coercion at all. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say uninitiated. There's no justification for uninitiated coercion whatsoever. Now it's very complicated to try and disentangle who caused what, right? If you've ever had uh, a significant other, right? Every time there's an argument, it started when you said that. No, it started when you said that, right? It's right. probably impossible for humans to disentangle it, but at least theoretically, like I don't think there's any natural justification for one human being to coerce another absent some initial, uh, Absent some need for retribution, you would say. Absent some need for retribution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm certainly not going to argue for unjustified coercion. Sure. Right? That's not an interest right. of mine. But then we're at the question of justice, right? Mm -hmm. It's something about symmetry, like what what initiates the or warrants the response of coercion. I don't know. Difficult yeah. question. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, Nietzsche does say something like it's inhuman to um, bless someone who curses you. Simply not human. I mean, there's right. no... In other words, if if you are... So this is taking issue with love thy enemy. Yes, absolutely. No. And, um, but see, there's a different way to understand love thy enemy. That is to say, there is a love thy enemy in the way I just described as between the marathon runners. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a natural, totally instinctively understandable response when somebody invades your land that you're going to attack them. Mm -hmm. There is a kind of natural doesn't need to be argued in the economy of human mm -hmm. discussion, right? And instead of just saying, well, I'll let you take my land and I'll give you my home and mm -hmm. I feel bad for you. That doesn't seem right, right? I mean, that seems very ill. Definitely. It seems, it's, it's, it's normal. Yeah. It's like Darwinian territoriality, right? When someone takes your land or your property. It's, I mean, that's what animals are doing all the time. They're fighting over territory as it were. I think humans just express that through property. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so I, I think, I think when it comes to justice there, you know, I, mean, I suppose we can talk about Nietzsche and justice, but, um, I'm mostly stuck on this issue of, uh, I mean, there, there is, there is justice and then there is seduction. And it seems to me that seduction is almost the harder, the harder question. Hmm. So, um, justice and seduction, what is the connection? No, oh, I'm sorry. They're, they're not connected. Oh, uh, I, I'm with you on the, on, on the justice piece. So let me ask you this, the, and now he's famed for his book beyond good and evil. Yeah. Um, what is the relationship between love and good and evil? It's only like the three most important words in the human race. So take your time. <laughs> All right. So when he says that the, when he says, you're referring to a line where he says that which comes from love is beyond good and evil. And I guess I'll go back to this. Did we talk about this offline or online? Uh, the will to a system is a lack of integrity. Offline. Offline. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I guess I'll dive into that. Yeah. yeah. So Nietzsche talks about 
um, Nietzsche has some some very deep and serious concerns about systematizing things. So um, I read a book that I found very obnoxious. I, I don't even remember the title of it, but it basically said something like, humanity is progressing toward a higher consciousness, and then it labels people into you know, a bunch of colors. You know, like, mm. before we were red, and now we're teal. Oh, the spiral dynamics? Something like that. I'm sure. sure. Yeah. And that's a framework, right? That's a yeah. system. That's a way to understand the world. Well, there's no real reason to believe that when we progress, we're actually going up or we're evolving. Mm -hmm. There's a preconceived set of principles that are often not honestly stated when they're stated. Like when the final idea or model is made, we actually have no idea what it is that they value. So if they value cooperation rather than competition, if they value, I don't know, I'm coming up with random stuff, violence over, uh, you know, unity. Mm -hmm. uh, um, if, if they see things a certain way. So Nietzsche basically sees everything as every every attempt to a system from Plato to Kant as being dishonest because it attempts to place upon the world something that's really not there. Mm -hmm. And he describes it actually as being or he, he seems to be he seems to be suggesting that actually philosophers are just very bad lovers. He says something like, suppose truth were a woman, right? And he goes, what? Is it not obvious that philosophers with their dogmatism have never once been able to seduce wisdom or truth in any serious way. Hmm. That is to say, if you're a dogmatist, like, can you really get laid? Does that make you, you know? a dogmatist if you're a philosopher, though? Because I read like Neoplatonists and whatnot, it seems like the opposite. They're, it's the love of wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. Philia Sophia. Sure. That, and wisdom is something that you never, kind of like truth, you never capture it, you never have it. It's this everlasting pursuit. So is he taking issue with dogmatism or philosophy more generally? I would say they're generally the same thing because in the end, if you say things like the forms exist, mm -hmm. you've already put something into the world that it's not evident to me is there. This is his issue with metaphysics again. That's it. Yeah. Exactly. All comes back to that. Yeah. So seduction, when it comes to love, love is a seduction, mm -hmm. right? And seduction is not just, I mean, obviously there's, there's some elements of the masculine feminine impulse, right? Like the the driving masculine impulse and the receiving feminine impulse mm -hmm. those are obviously there yeah. but it's it's not just the man going up to a girl and he goes i want you and she right. goes okay right 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 it doesn't, right, right, doesn't right. work that it's, way there's the dance yes yeah. and he says that systems are basically that they go to the world they say you're this way and the world goes okay and that's bad right? so it's the issue then of taking the system as the final answer whereas instead of looking at it something more provisional perhaps whereas you know you want to run english here in america mostly but if we go to france maybe we should speak french right there's different tools for different jobs that's that's fair and that's interesting i mean i guess i would i would want to know in what way morality is provisional inherently and and there we encounter this very rapid difficulty whereby everybody thinks they're an expert in good and evil but nobody actually discusses what they understand to be good and evil yeah and then, morality is yeah. a very tricky one yes. and i and all systems ultimately so far have been based I mean, on a morality that's it yeah. judaism and christianity have made it so right yeah i think the morality and maybe this is just me drinking too much of the economics incentives kool-aid um, some of this is based on Peterson's view that, you know, like even wolves have a proto morality where they have an alpha male dispute. They don't right. fight to the death. One of them rolls over, gives up his neck. That's like the signal that, all right, I forfeit. Um, because you need, there's a utility in having that wolf to bring down the moose the next day, et cetera. It seems to me like, um, I kind of run this thought experiment. If all the capital in the world just vanished, like right now, for sure gone like all the houses all the clothes all the technology all the equipment like what would morality do like i think morality would quickly degenerate from our current our current perspective of significant capital accumulation right that y we know after this podcast we can go get a steak down the hill we're going to put on our nice warm clothes we call a driver get on a plane fly out like all these conveniences that afford us the luxury of dealing with each other in this more civilized way. I think if you take away the capital substrate that morality would degenerate. That's my thought experiment of, of thinking morality is kind of like manners that um, are most useful given the context of our capital accumulation. Well, 
And I know that's not a yeah. totalizing answer, by the way, but I think it has something to do with it. No, it's compelling. I mean, I think I think Nietzsche would say something like, the only reason why that civility would disappear is because we're used to so many wants. Mm. So there is a world, right? A conceivable world whereby all the capital disappeared and everybody was just cheerful and independent. But they would be struggling, right? Like think of all the... Think of what would happen to us right now. We're sitting in Jackson Hole and like there's What's six happening? feet of snow outside. We'd be fucking dead. Robert Both and I capital. would split a TV and start eating it with the wires and... <laughs> no, no, it's all gone. Poof. Oh, all of it oh, vanishes. All the capital. The, your glasses are gone. All of our tools, all of our goods, all of our food, everything we've accumulated over time, gone. It still seems to me like that world could still be one where you and I have a good humor about it. You say, okay, there's no capital. Now we're freezing and naked and... We'll still laugh, right? I mean, maybe I because have? we have that yeah. morality that evolves under after many centuries of capital accumulation. Maybe we could face it like that. It would take a lot of stoicism and and grit. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I. All that. Yeah, I mean, that's a yeah. big tangent. But my answer is like when you say what is morality, I think this is emergent, kind of like a technology. It's like an emergent social technology, mm -hmm. similar to language, perhaps. Yes. Um, but more concentrated in the domain of action and perception rather than conception. Morality is in the domain of action and perception, you said? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. That is to say, to some extent, and tell me if I'm if I'm misunderstanding you, but to some extent, morality is certainly a product of environment. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, so you're, you know, wolves will have a different morality than dogs mm -hmm. for good reason. Yep. Um, yep. Dogs do not <laughs> turn their neck up to say, I surrender. They've lost that instinct. Yes. Yeah. Um, they they will look up at you for food, right? Right. Uh, and that's a very different animal, a very domesticated one. Product of environment, but also, I mean, it's unique with humans. Yes. Because we've yes. spent centuries to build all this stuff. Right. Also, yes. So we, we're reshaping our environment actively in ways that animals are not. But, right. Well, that's. I think that's what makes humanity so exciting and so interesting as a project, right? That is to say, we had chance men of genius over time who came up with new moralities, came mm -hmm. up with new ways of right. living. And they did institute it upon the world. They were able to seduce the world into some kind of living, mm -hmm. some way of living. And yes, yeah, sometimes there was war, um, but more or less in the end, right? People followed it because they were seduced by it. Mm. Somebody was. So, um, so now we're at this interesting, I mean, just to kind of tie this all back together, we're at this very interesting moment where we've had we've all been seduced by one type of morality mm -hmm. and it's long been dead i think nietzsche would say in the 21st century that that it's more or less dead and nihilism is slowly eating away in that space in that power vacuum mm. then he says you finally have this chance to choose you can actually take who you are and you can bring it into the world and you can engage and seduce world others with yourself with a new way of seeing the world that actually compels you to believe in it, to believe in life's value, mm -hmm. which can't really be summed up. You can't actually place a value on life. Mm -hmm. You can't estimate the value of life. So, but you can, you can presume a certain value and you can implement certain ways of living or, or you can make certain observations or you can internalize certain insights that make life even more seductive than it already is. That's what I think Christ did in I, my I estimation. That. So totally like the that. ironically because it was all about the next life. Well, okay. Right. This might be a strange argument too. But you know, humans made this evolutionary trade-off for higher cognitive development that were born really early and feeble. So you know, you see a horse have uh, a mirror and it stands up and walks, right? Well, humans, we take nine months, a year, 50, however long it takes us to walk. That was an evolutionary trade-off because we're smart, right? We have the rationality, we have command over language, the logos, essentially. And one of the core teachings of Christianity, I would say like this is probably the most important value in the Christian corpus is agape, right? The selfless, absolute, selfless love, that God has for his children, or you could say that parents have for their children. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's 
distinct from eros, distinct from philia, yeah. which are two other um, terms for love in ancient Greek. Agape is like uh, the ultimate love, you might yeah. say. Now, so scientifically... Familial, usually. Familial, yeah. thank you. Agape. But usually direct from parents to children, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the key point there in my, uh, as I understand it, not a expert in this domain, it's the selflessness, right? Because philia is reciprocal, like we're friends. So that means we want ongoing reciprocal engagement, right? Mm -hmm. I want to get to know you more deeply so you can know me more deeply <clears throat> and so on and so forth. Same with your friends, same with your lovers. But with uh, an infant, a newborn infant, there's not even reciprocity. Right. It's just this inert lump that you love, like beyond your heart's just exploding with love, right? I think inert lump is the best description <laughs> I've heard in a very so, long time. So where I want to tie this together is that because humans made this evolutionary trade-off and we had to be born early, right? More feeble so we could have this higher cognitive thing. Um, agape is necessary. There is no living adult on this planet that did not receive agape from at least one person to reach adulthood. 100%. So there's a deep fundamental scientific truth about the nature of agape and how important it is. You could yes. say it's like without that value, if it's a value, I'm not sure, without that principle or without that... Sign without, of health? Without say it adult way. humans being selfless towards their infants, right? It, you but it would, can't be purely selfless, right? Again, not to get tangled up in the semantics. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is Agape is universally necessary, and we've all benefited from it with zero exceptions. There are literally zero. It's not possible. Zero exceptions. It's impossible. Yes. You can't even put an infant in an incubator and like get them. First of all, who built the incubator? All that, but children die without touch, right? There's mm -hmm. these awful experiments in Romania, I think, where there are all these extra children. They weren't getting love. Yes. They die, basically. Yes. Um, so maybe christianity i mean or the example of christ is that he's he's the living embodiment of agape and so when i don't this is where i and i don't know nietzsche enough but to like just try and throw all that out i'm like well there's there's also this idea that christ was instrumental in the invention of the individual as the primary social role there are these things that are fundamentally like economically pragmatically necessary and so i'm when I hear Nietzsche ripping it all up and throwing it out, uh, I get concerned. Well, nothing you've said precipitates or, you know, pr is predicated on the existence of God. You've described well, I think God, God's project and intention. Yes. But the reality of God does not have to exist for Christ to be a model of something I in any way. Agreed with that. But I think the exemplification of agape as I said, is necessary for humans to reach adulthood and the degree to which we amplify that towards others, it actually creates better outcomes, right? We, more trust, more division of labor, more wealth, more peace, more human flourishing. Well, let's, this, this might be interesting. So we wear the mask of Jesus, right? For a moment. And we say, that's a good way to put it, right? We, we say yeah. agape in this moment. Mm not turn the other cheek agape because again i i think i think that's virtually inhuman i think that's incredible i i just i can't believe that it really exists and i can't believe that that's healthy <laughs> let's just leave it there mm. but let's talk about right jesus is agape you're an infant you're you know your infant has a temper tantrum of course you have this kind of love you tolerate it not only tolerate it but somehow there's something beautiful about it for you there's no problem mm. bearing this this issue because the infant is yours and you you have agape for your infant um but then the child gets older and i think you need to wear a different mask right you need to say something like agape doesn't make this child run marathons quite or rather i think it does but but you want to spark in this child eros mm -hmm. you want this child to wake up one day and say i have a pursuit mm -hmm. and that's partly innate right that's not something a parent can totally give. Some children will have it, some won't. Mm -hmm. It's not a universal impulse. But if they do, you want to drive them towards whatever whatever emotions or circumstances will let them be caught by that bug, as it were, mm -hmm. and pursue it. And that, it seems to me, does not fit under the banner of Jesus as a mask, right? Maybe Caesar would be a better mask for that. Hmm. Caesar being, right, a guy who leaves Rome for 10 years, 
and goes out and he conquers other peoples and and he goes and he but that whole game degenerates that's the problem so i think it could be argued again just through an economic sense like which sure if we're all wearing the caesar mask what does the world become versus we're all wearing the christ mask is that and if human yeah. flourishing is the metric I think it could be strongly argued that the Christ mask is going to lead us closer to that. But I have to say it again and again that this is not an impulse to universalize. Mm. We're only speaking to a few people here in a concrete sense. Not everyone can wear the Jesus mask and not everyone should. Mm. Not everyone can wear the Caesar mask and not everyone should. They will have new masks we've never heard of and they'll have masks that have been worn before. But that's exactly it. This this impulse to say what's good for one must be good for everyone can't can't work. Is that moral relativism then? No, because I think there is a way to say that some ideas are better than others. The question is, well, how? Yes, how? Yeah, it's a very concrete question. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all-around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. My take on it is that we know health when we see it. Hmm. That's my belief. That's my suspicion. And sometimes, sometimes we may not. Sometimes there may be someone who is... Uh, this is a weird thing to say, but someone who is so healthy that it almost scares us. That is to say, they are capable of a cruelty toward themselves. They're, they're able to self-iterate, not in this kind of demeaning, made lesser than way, but they are so sure of the path that they're on and are so capable of getting better so quickly that it's almost incomprehensible to us. It, it may scare us. Like mm. A person who, let's suppose that, as an example, that Somebody breaks the three minute mile, but then they're so, they find a way, not by any technological means, but truly, purely through self iteration to break the two minute mile and the one minute mile. Mm -hmm. That person would be very strange, would be alien. You really wouldn't mm -hmm. know what to do with them. So I say, I'm saying take that abstract idea and apply it to um, somebody's interpretation of the world or how somebody sees life or how somebody understands life is uh, life is being uh livable so so yeah i guess that's that's what i'm trying to get so at saying that better ideas facilitate better health i i might even i might even suggest that better health facilitates better ideas that i, I don't know okay. where the chicken or egg right, really right. starts and, but well but in but, reality it doesn't we don't know where it starts, right? It's always feedback loops. Yeah. I think it's interesting you chose the word health, though, because, I mean, it's closely related to the word wealth, actually, if you trace it back. And again, if you're wearing what the economics hat on, like, I think the division of labor is the most valuable things that humans can do, which is to say, cooperate to accomplish greater results with less efforts, right? That's how we create civilization. Sure. And I think there's something really, there's a, fundamental contribution of Christ to that entire enterprise. And so I'm just, 
and again, not knowing enough about Nietzsche, but I don't think you can just arbitrarily pull out the most, the foundations of civilization and say, oh, we should just pick other values. If that's what he's saying, I might be misunderstanding. Um, two things, just, just because it's still lingering in my head. The first is that my personal take on perspectivism or how we know that one perspective is better than another mm -hmm. is, is fundamentally going to be to some extent biology. Biology will play a big part in that. Mm -hmm. It's my suspicion. So that's the health piece. Yes, yes. exactly. Okay. That is to say that weak people know what strength is mm -hmm. and they may hate it. They may be jealous of it. They may be resentful of it, but they know it when they see it. Mm -hmm. And strong people know a stronger person when they see it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Someone who refuses to succumb to an illness. That's very compelling. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche himself was subject to many illnesses and he actually was overcome in the end by a, what seems to be a congenital disease. But um, the fact that he was able to hike eight hours a day and he was still writing wow. some of the most profound works that we can think of. Yeah, he was apparently like a very muscular man. Very strange. Eight hours a day hiking. Wow. Yeah. And apparently with no stops, like no exhaustion whatsoever. He just came back and he kept writing. He had no that explains a lot. Yeah, yeah. So there is some, there is some sense of, you know, Caesar similarly, right? A very compelling man. He also had seizures. He was very pasty white. He was slept right there on the floor with his men. He dug with his men. He fought with his men. He moved at paces that no one thought possible moving through mountains in three months in the winter um, with an entire caravan. I mean, I just, you know, he's inconceivable. Yeah. They would build whole structures overnight. I mean, in a night, it was basically impossible to break a Roman uh, siege or a, a Roman uh, defense line. So, um, so, so that's that's sort of the thought that I have, which is fundamentally the sense that we we know when something is better. We know when an idea is better than another idea. Or we we might have an instinct for that. Mm. Um, um, so that's one. And then I I. I want to go back to what you said. Would you mind saying it again? I'm, I'm really sorry. This was... Which part? Yeah. Uh, so you talked about not wanting to pull Christ out from under. under us. I just... Uh, I, it seems to me like this entire process of civilization is built in layers. I think that's right. right. We're, we're, we're bootstrapping not only our accumulation of capital, which is tools and useful things in the world, but also language is evolving in tandem. I think our morality... Uh, our legal systems, right? These are all codes, right? Moral codes, legal codes, um, software code. Now today, mm -hmm. I I am concerned about removing the, if you want to call it even Christ, just mythological, which I'm okay with. I'm concerned about removing the mythological foundations from civilization. I don't... Well, he's not the only foundation, right? We also had the Greeks and we had the pre-Socratics specifically. We have the mm -hmm. French... We've had curiosity. But none of them had the individual as the primary social role. So individual private property rights, for instance, extended, were extended as a result of Christ's existence. Well, the martyrs yeah. we talked about earlier, they were actively reforming legal systems through their martyrdom. Mm -hmm. So when you take away that people, that option of mask to put on, I guess, I think the whole of world history looks really different. So I, I yeah, I, I agree with that. I think whatever comes after this will have to be very creative in such a way that it includes parts that we like, mm -hmm. excludes parts that we don't and puts in parts we've never seen. Mm -hmm. So is it possible to build a Sparta today? Not with the people we have where everybody feels very individualistic, right? Mm -hmm. I think that would be very, very hard to do. You know, if you wanted to be a Spartan, you would say that's 300 years of hard work yeah. and we are all committed to this one idea of being Right. I think, I mean, I think the Spartans wanted to be the biologically superior race. I think yeah. that's a, a good summation of what the Spartans right. were, right? So that can't be done with individuals, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. So if you were to pull individualism out from under us, you would be trying to go back to that, some version of that. But if you decided to keep that piece in and you ripped out this fundamental disinclination toward living that I, I, I don't want to be too hard on Christianity because again, I, what's I the disinclination so toward church, living? But... Where does that come from? Well, doesn't that seem to be the, are you saying the emphasis on the afterlife versus the present life? Yeah. But that also manifests itself in, in so many ways, right? The talking about healing the, the weak, the ill, mm -hmm. helping the poor, right? There's no, the Greeks would have been horrified by that right they would have said no our focus is on greatness yeah on great art and and even moments but in paradoxically where, that well, short changed their greatness 
They could not get private property rights and get as wealthy as we are today because they didn't have the Christ mask. Well, they didn't want to be wealthy, right? They're in yes, fact, of course they did. Well, they Who's, can... who, what human has ever lived across human history that hasn't aspired to wealth and power? Well, I don't yeah. think any. Let's well, let's yeah. Anyone that likes to eat that. or breathe, like you've wanted wealth or power. Well, there, are, yeah, there are a few examples I can think of. I can't remember this philosopher's name, um, but he uh, he basically, if I, I can't even remember if he was clothed in rags or was just naked. I think he was naked. And he walked one of the Stoics, right? Yeah, lived in a well, barrel. Yeah, I believe so. And he had a cup, a bowl. When, when Alexander the Great, I think it was Alexander the Great, yeah, went to talk to him. He said, "Could you scoot a little to the left? You're in my sunshine." My son, yeah, right. there, there are a few characters like that. Uh, this, this particular guy I'm thinking about saw a child drinking with his hands without a bowl. Mm -hmm. He said, "Wait, you're saying I don't need this bowl?" And <laughs> breaks it. You know, he throws it on the ground. Yeah. He says, "Which of you slaves?" He actually goes up to an auction. And he stands at the top and he says, which of you slaves would like to buy a free man? Hmm. There's something, you know, there's a way in which that's an incredibly compelling picture. Right? Hmm. Very contrary to what we would expect. And by the end, I mean, I think he said something like he, I think the, a king bought him or a prince bought him. And then he was, he, he went up to, he went to the prince while he was, you know, being carried away as a slave. And he said, you know, I, I looked at your wife and I noticed that she's attracted to me. Hmm. The guy said, is that true? And the wife nodded her head, sort of in concern or shock. And then he was just let free again. <laughs> you hmm. know, this is very strange. So so I guess I, I want to say something like, look, wealth, wealth is not the end all be all. I mean, another related example, and this is actually quite important. The Greeks gave their slaves the wealth making obligations. So they actually, they did not believe that being a merchant was tasteful. They yeah, it was and they were wrong. Well, well, okay, not tasteful, distasteful, but again, I guess I every time I say wrong, I see now I'm putting the frame of human flourishing. I'm presupposing the aim of human flourishing, which is necessitates well, mm -hmm. aggregate wealth creation. This doesn't mean you're an individual, like money grubbing guy, and the word wealth is very dirty. Yes. For whatever reason sure. in fiat world, but it's like we're doing it all the time, right? Come on, we're all wearing clothes, we're in a right, house. Right, like, right. if well, if you want to like live and eat and even be able to have these conversations, you have to have wealth beneath you. And then to have wealth, to optimize wealth, you need private property rights. To have private property rights, you need the idea of individualism. To have the idea of individualism, you need Christ. So I'm concerned if you pull that out, the effect it has up the whole stack. I just want to say one once again that I'm not sure what human flourishing is, and I think that's what's up to for debate for Nietzsche. That's exactly Le leisure Nietzsche. time. That's it. So yeah. again, and again, I think that's. I think Nietzsche would say maybe he would agree with you, but mm. that that leisure time does not necessitate tremendous wealth, and he he was not necessarily that's poor. true. Can, but yeah. again, poverty. He says, right? This is one of the things I I think I sent you, but he he has a line where he says. Poverty, cheer cheerfulness, independence. Is it possible to conceive of a man who's constituted that way? Mm -hmm. Then he says, poverty, cheerfulness, slavery. Is it not also possible that a man is conceived that way? Mm -hmm. And then he says something which I think is very interesting, that this machine that we built, civil civilization altogether, requires that some people be screws in that machine or cogs in that machine. Mm -hmm. He says that that necessitates here wealth, human flourishing, mm -hmm. as as we call it, or as, as you're as you're describing, mm -hmm. that there are inevitably going to be people in that who are a cog and who don't deserve to be a cog. They have something in them that would be interesting if they had the ability to work on it, and yes. instead they are factory workers, as they once were at his, in his time, right. or they are working on a computer for 12 hours a day on someone else's project, or even, you know, it could just be that they're great coders, but that actually their, their inner flowers will only open or their, their plants that will only open at a certain other activity or at a certain mm -hmm. other way of being, which is to say, for all I know, being in the cold right. alone for a year you know, in some part of the world that uh, everybody would find deeply uninteresting, but to him just activates some part of him. Like maybe he's, he's got that, I don't know, the Siberian kick in him where he feels warm in the cold. So, you know I mean? so freedom's necessary for that. Yeah, exactly. But that freedom and wealth are not always, they're correlated, but they're not one-to-one -one. and that some people simply need to want less. 
Right. And sure, that's fine. I agree with that, actually. Yeah. That it's So Nietzsche's making this distinction that true individualism and civilization may actually be at odds with one another. And that's... that's I definitely disagree. Right. So yeah. I think that's that's where he ends up probably... Maybe it's, maybe it's in the definition of freedom then. Because clearly what you just said, like if there are cogs in the machine that should not be... Or not should not. There are cogs in this machine of civilization that might have something in themselves that they would otherwise express if they were not a cog in the machine. Yes, that's okay. right. Okay, so in order for that cog in the machine to move out of that position into another position and express themselves differently, that necessitates freedom. Okay. How could a cog ever... It's social, um, sure. social mobility, right? That you could move up. The American dream, we talk about this. You can come here, be a janitor, save your money, and then one day you'll be able to retire comfortably with your family. Obviously, the American dream is probably dead, in, uh, unless you're a Bitcoiner. <laughs> um, but this idea that... Um, now I've lost my train of thought. Just basically, basically that... I mean, you're. it seems to me that you're saying social mobility is what enables people to have more options... And more, I was going and towards optionality, yeah. essentially. And, and civilization, civilization is the expansion of optionality. Options. Right. And then I think Nietzsche would say something like... Not to say that it's necessary. You could be right. the guy in the barrel and be happy as a clam. But I would argue then you're probably putting on a performance. Because you're probably in poor health. You're probably underfed. Probably don't have good shelter. And you're probably choosing to run stoicism as your mask. To say, excuse me, Mr. Alexander the Great, you're blocking my sunshine. I don't know. I mean, truly, I don't know. I, this is this is what gets to me about the world we live in. I will say this, right? Whether I agree with Nietzsche or not, I will say that the diversity of characters in this world is shrinking. It seems to be shrinking. That is to say, everyone feels more and more like they're a cog in the machine. There's yeah. a guy named Oswald Spengler who basically was very bleak, and he said something like, "We're on this road." where technology is just going to run at ever faster paces. And contrary to the useless eater theory, uh -huh. it will actually require more and more hands on deck to keep the machine alive. Uh -huh. And at some point it will eat itself. It, a snake will eat its own tail and it will collapse. Hmm. That's his theory. If he's and, talking about the fiat system, I agree. Yes. I think, I yeah. mean, I wonder, I actually was going to say something like, I think Bitcoin enables people to be the kind of independent Absolutely. That was describing. Absolutely. Outside of civilization, outside of, in other words, if you want to be a guy in a barrel and you have your money in Bitcoin. The sovereign individual. You're a dude yeah. in a barrel, you know, you're whatever. Yeah. You're touring or, the world on your own with a backpack and your money is with you and mm -hmm. you could have a billion dollars in your head mm -hmm. and you're fine. You don't really need to live in any particular way. Civilization, right. I mean, like, look, the catch with civilization, it seems to me, is that it says something like, you can live here, you can do things here, you follow by these rules, which by force of violence, we will prevent you from breaking. Mm -hmm. And um, you also have to put time back into the civilization. Yeah. And those are two things that free men don't engage in. Those are two things I think free men would dislike. The first is rules that we're stuck in that we have to abide by. And the second is I have to put time into something that I don't want to put time into. Those are, those are absolutely not under the category of freedom. So it's I, don't, I, I disagree okay. because yeah, if it's, if it's it. consensual, right? This is employment. I consent That's to fine. sell you my labor for whatever, whatever money you're going to pay me. So long as I have the right to say no, then we're all still free. I'm doing the thing I want to do, whether I say I don't want to do it or not. My actions say otherwise. But don't you think that there's some kind of, there's some kind of danger to the friction between doing what you quote unquote really want to do and and what you're consenting to doing now getting greater and greater until you're no longer really able to do what you wanted to do. So somebody says, there's something in me that's very special and, you know, I feel it. And if I could, I would go and be uh, living on a river. And I wish I had a little more money to do that because there are certain conveniences that would make it easier for me. But now that I'm working this job, I'm kind of stuck in this rhythm, right? I, I work this factory job, I meet a girl, I have kids, mm -hmm. and this thing that I might have been able to do that would have allowed that would have had me sacrifice marriage and employment mm -hmm. now is too great. And also there are no examples of anyone I know doing it. There's no chance for me to really understand that as an option. Mm -hmm. So I think 
civilization has this kind of shadow shadow cast over it whereby it doesn't advertise to you options that don't benefit it. And that, it seems to me, is a very real thing. In other words, you can only but consent a... to what you know. If you don't know, but you have an instinct for something, but you're afraid, you you know, I'm not going to try agree to with hunt that. a moose if I don't know how to hunt it, right? I agree with what you said, that yeah. civilization only benefits people for things that benefit it. Again, we're kind of making civilization this big. Where do you draw the line around it? But as a participant in civilization, if you're improving civilization, it's like improving your own house in a way. So there's a mutual benefit. I, I don't know if improving the state improves you. Not the state, civilization. Is there I think the state today, is there a difference? And I really I really have to ask that carefully. That is to say Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So help me understand that. Yeah. Understand the state the is not the market. The market is okay. people freely interacting and consensually engaging in trade and work to produce capital. The state is um, the monopoly on violence that plunders that capital through mm -hmm. the systematic violation of private property, mm -hmm. through inflation, taxation, and regulation. Mm -hmm. They're fundamentally different. I would say they're actually diametrically opposed. Free market consensual behavior and um, the killing, stealing, and destroying by the state. However, when you look at evolution, things tend to evolve in pairs like that, right? There's uh, they co-evolve, right? So predator and prey in an environment, they they evolve together. So maybe it's necessary to create civilization. Now that I don't know about. That's like beyond me. Right. But to the degree that we can mitigate this need for coercion, violence, non-consensual exchange in human affairs, I think we can increase human flourishing. And that's leisure time, capital accumulation, innovation, morality, peace, freedom, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, arts, like all the good things in life, I think we can improve by minimizing statism. So I think they're very different. I think this is why I have trouble being very passionate about the idea of the free market, precisely because it does seem to me to be very deeply tied to statism. It does seem to be ultimately I mean, I'm probably going to get a lot of flack for this, but it does seem to be a kind of meat grinder of sorts that to fundamentally sacrifice, human sacrifice insofar as people having to put time in to accumulate wealth, they may, if, you know, for all I know, they don't really want it, right? They just don't have the option to understand. Can't they opt out though? You can opt out. You can go live somewhere, well, live nowhere on a tent if you want. Even a tent's capital, by the way. Yeah, that's right. That's true. <laughs> yeah, even, I mean, again, you know, in all fairness, if you are, uh, if you live in the Amazon and you somehow used your hands to put together uh, a little uh, uh, place to shelter yourself, you're a capitalist. You are developing capital. I don't know if I would say you're a capitalist, but you're certainly accumulating capital. You I, delayed gratification to create something for future use. Yeah. You're a capitalist. Look, yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not denying that there's an inevitable element to this. That is to say, the Greeks were incredibly interested in developing ornate temples and mm -hmm, art. Mm -hmm. And um, some of that, you know, some of the art that's been done before us, we don't actually know how they did. We have mm -hmm. no idea. I mean, they were incredibly advanced and I'm incredibly interested in bringing that kind of thing back. I have a whole thing, whole diatribe about architectural terrorism, which I think we're going through. <laughs> but it seems to me that, that making that the sole focus, right? Economics, the base of the superstructure mm -hmm. is wrong. I don't think it's the base. What do you think it is? I think it's mythology. I think we live in stories. We and live in stories. This is a whole rabbit. We don't have time to go down this rabbit hole. <laughs> but um, to your point of performance and wearing masks, like yes. we are the animal that can tell stories. Yes. So we tell these stories, right? Money, nation states, human rights, you name it, these social constructs. And then we inhabit roles inside of them. Mm -hmm. And we actually wear clothing mm -hmm. to indicate what role we're fulfilling at any given time. Yes. As you may wear different clothes to work versus to go out at night versus to lounge around the house. Um, you're signaling to other people your position in that socially constructed hierarchy. Yeah. Um, well, that just to, just to bring that all back, right? I mean, this is, 
the kind of childlike innocence that lets people experiment with clothes, as it were, uh -huh. their roles, their ability to create stories. But again, stories, as Nietzsche says, we can no longer create a mythology that is something like there's a Zeus in the sky. Uh -huh. There's a Zeus and he has a wife named Hera and they all have these ideas or there's the one true God. Um, those stories are no longer believable. That whole apparatus has collapsed. And so the question is, what what can we create that is fundamentally believable? In mm -hmm. other words, what in what way can we seduce people without a system? What language what language can we use that allows people to again be seduced by life as something compelling in itself? And I do not believe that capital accumulation inherently creates any erotic tension in a person. Mm. That's for sure, right? You could yeah. people talk about that over. And it over gives again. people the freedom, though. I agree it, with that. It, it does doesn't some, right? It does, and it maybe does it does things. create an erotic passion in some people, like right. some people. Though maybe perhaps the wrong the, the traditionally demonized capitalist, right? The guy that just yeah. the miser, the Scrooge, whatever. Mm -hmm. But absent that small subset, it gives people freedom to then figure out what it is. What is that burning passion? Yeah, inevitably. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm trying to be a contrarian here. Inevitably, yes, there will need to be capital accumulation for any group of people to come together when they're bored as hell and go, all right, what are we doing here? Yeah. Right? And that's basically where we're at. Like, we're like, okay, nothing seems to be worth living for, right? We like, there are a lot of people who just sit there depressed in their homes watching that. How much do you think that's a result of fiat though? Well, yeah, I mean, Nietzsche also talks about the fact that even under the gold standard, we had people who were too impatient mm. and wanted to accumulate massive amounts of wealth. And that happens to be sociological, right? Like we happen to be lucky enough to see what he saw. Yeah. He said three quarters of our wealthy are engaged in fraud, legal right, right, fraud. Right. Legal counterfeiting. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So he he's basically saying something like the gold standard doesn't solve the fundamental problem. These people just did not believe in anything. That's the real problem. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe in God. They didn't abide by God's rules. And when we get back on Bitcoin, this is my take, personal take on Bitcoin, and it's very modest, right? It's that it opens the door to this kind of culture or this kind of seduction being possible again. Okay. That's all it does, right? It takes away the rampant... Um, inflationary tendencies that we have which is mm. right we sell our bodies now we I mean, we do yeah. all kinds of things that that yeah. i think people would have a lower time preference if we had the gold standard and we had bitcoin mm -hmm. and in fact right in nietzsche's time there was a lower time preference mm -hmm. he was able to go travel even on limited money because he had money to begin with right, right? let's just be real here so so bitcoin just shakes our society back up and if we're lucky, it will hopefully be um, Bitcoiners who get the chance to start seeing interesting things. I, I just want to say one other thing that I that that I think is interesting about the will to a system and and sort of the caution that that, that entails. When we attempt to take a series, you know, fundamentally, a will to a system is either a series of personal beliefs or customs or a series of observations that we then want to try to bundled together in this, it is definitely true way, mm -hmm. right? Universally true, everyone should follow it and so on. The analogy that I've, I've seen is that that's sort of akin to a man looking under a girl's skirt and saying that she opened herself up to him. Hmm. But it's a kind of violence that there, there wasn't really sex happening there, right? You didn't really or anything sexual you didn't really see her mm -hmm. right you you committed some kind of violence on the world and the, so it's like in the end do i believe that the crooked could be made straight yes i think machiavelli showed that i think you know but each time that we've you know ecclesiastes was wrong, right king solomon if he wrote it was wrong like the crooked can in fact be made straight with a lot of effort the corrupted can be made uncorrupted mm. bitcoin can in fact straighten bitcoin among other things right can in fact straighten what was once not straight um, but that takes time and that takes an extended time horizon. Um, and I'm, I'm going a little all over the place here, but I'm trying to wrap, like wrap this all into a thought. Rousseau had this feeling, right? That man was infinitely flexible and yeah. he's a very interesting guy. He's also, it's also a very dangerous idea, but in a sense, perhaps it is true that over 2000 years, 
men can be very different from what he is now. He can't be different in 50 years, like right. Rousseauians seem to believe today. He can't be different in a day, necessarily. Um, although I think, you know, there are moments in our lives where it's like lightning strikes and the next day we're really a different mm -hmm. person. But if we have this kind of longer vision that Nietzsche suggests without saying something like forever or the infinite, mm -hmm. maybe we can really create a new worthwhile poetic language and a new worthwhile kind of eros and love that, you know, among each other and for each other and for the world that we've never really seen before. Mm. I guess I, I kind of yeah. want to take that. And I think Bitcoin really opens the door to that. It gives us a chance to get out of the Weimar Republic. I think that's a beautiful place yeah. to call it a show. Robert, this is a fascinating conversation. Uh, my head's twisted in knots now. I need to read more Nietzsche. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at RJ Malka, M A L K A. Uh, you can also email me anytime at robert at malkarobert.org, so, or dot com, excuse me, there's not a word there. So robert at M-A-L-K-A-R-O-B-E-R-T dot com. Um, also, I have to say this, as part of the Bitcoin Today Coalition, we are working on um, getting Bitcoiners into jobs that are not Bitcoiner specific. That is to say, we want Bitcoiners in policy positions, we want hmm. Bitcoiners in regulatory bodies. We need people on the inside to open up our view of things because treasury is all dark and right now this administration does not seem to be very, to be very warm towards Bitcoin. Congress is grid gridlocked and we, we really need you. Uh, if you have qualifications or you know someone who does, orange pill the shit out of them mm -hmm. and get them into Lummis's office and beyond. Um, there, are not, there are so many jobs out there where, where a, really big, a Bitcoiner could really be useful. Sounds like quite the noble pursuit. Uh, Thank you for doing what you do. Uh, totally. Thanks. Thanks, man.